In our first story, the Eastern Regional Security Council is meeting with stakeholders and other interested groups to take a decision on the violence that erupted yesterday in Odumasi Krobo. The first of a series of meetings took place at the Paramount Chief's Palace, where regional minister and security chiefs deliberated on how to resolve the issue at hand. One person is dead, two are in critical condition, and one police officer is still on admission at the St. Martin de Porres Hospital after yesterday's clash between residents and the police over a disconnection exercise being conducted by the Power Distribution Services, PDS, in Agromanga. Correspondent Kofi Siao will join us on the phone with the latest. But um, before we get to Kofi Siao, let's go and hear what has been ongoing there. I think we have Kofi on the line now. Uh, Kofi, is the meeting over? And what's the outcome of the RECSEC meeting? Right. I can do some report. Kofi, pardon me. Is the meeting over? And what's the outcome of the RECSEC meeting? <laughs> Right. Um, so we have Stephen joining us on the line, brother. Uh, Stephen, what's the outcome of the RECSEC meeting? All right. So um, uh, uh, what is happening currently is the police are going about their uh, normal duty, patrolling the whole community. Expectations are very high, so business is not going on that just smoothly because a lot of people don't know what will be the next line of the police. So most shops have opened. And so when you see a lot of people gathered, try to discuss what happened yesterday, so... I can tell you, tensions are very high. I can see a lot of uh, armed police cars at the municipal assembly. So that's what is happening currently at Lower Maniakov Municipal Assembly. We understand there was to be a meeting of a RECSEC and the regional minister. Has that meeting taken place? The meeting has taken place. The minister has, has almost moved out of the municipal assembly. What the minister is saying, like, he's going to assure us there's going to be security and the PDS, between the PDS and the police minister, so that they are going to find a makeable solution to what is happening. Right. Um, Stephen, what more can you report from the Lower Mayan Krobo area? <laughs> All right. So I went to the hospital this morning, and I get back to some of the shops, which are close to the incident that took place yesterday. And some of the shop owners showed me live bullets that have been shot into their various shops, and then they showed me the shells of their bullets. So they said they're going to make a case out of that. And um, there's a school, which is very close to the municipal assembly, where the incident took place yesterday. They are also saying they are going to shut the school down because they can't guarantee the safety of the kids in their hands. So the school will be shut down for the meantime to further the system. Thank you very much, Stephen Asari, for joining us. He's our man at Sky FM. He just reported from the Lower Manya Krobo area. The Member of Parliament for the area, Ebenezer Taylor, B tells Joy News, a meeting will be convened with the PRC and the PDS on the way forward. He spoke to my colleague, Bernice Abubedu Lanza. What happened yesterday? You know, was not a direct issue of disconnection. It was, you know, a visit, you know, by one of the sub chiefs whose son was killed to the municipal assembly. Ostens I mean, uh, uh, ostensibly to, you know, uh, uh, wanting to ask because of what, you know, the police did in his area, in his community about three, four days ago. He decided to go and see the municipal chief executive for some explanation because according to him uh, the way the police you know were shooting left right it it, it it threw a lot of people into the bush I mean old ladies running away and things like that so he decided to go to the MC in the morning as a chief <laughs> it doesn't work alone if if the chief is going to you know is going out to visit somebody goes to that interact so people followed him when he got there the MC left the office and then they called for police and there was the information that he was slapped. The chief was slapped. And definitely if a chief is moving with his people and you slap a chief, you don't expect that the people will also. So that was how the whole thing started. And, 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 and therefore, mm, uh, 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 led to the shooting, mm. which I, I found you know, very unfortunate. Away from that story, residents of Tripony in the northern region have presented a statement to the police in the area, impressing on them to enforce the curfew imposed yesterday. One more person was found dead in renewed Chokosi Konkomba clashes after another community was attacked last night. The angry residents protesting this morning over what they say is the failure of security personnel to maintain peace in the area converged as the police station this morning to mount pressure on the police to ensure peace. We stand here and we stand in peace. 
this morning to present our grievances to the President, His Excellency Nana Adodankwa Ekupuaku. We, the women and children, are here to let Nana do know that the security situation in our community keeps on deteriorating every day. There is sporadic attacks at every community away from Tripoli. We, the women and children, are most vulnerable and appealing to the government to do the following for us. One, our major roads need police barriers. The soldiers should have their tents for outskirts and insecure points to our communities. Allow the police to do the community patrolling. Though not official, but if it could be true that our men should not use motorbike, then the government should know that Tripoli and its environment has few days to survive, which means women and children of Tripoli cannot withstand. Let's speak to our correspondent Martina Bogri now. Martina, how is Tripoli at the moment? Have the protesters dispersed? Yes, um, as they are dispersed, people have gone back to their homes and people have gone to begin their work and they are hoping that um, the petition they have presented uh, would actually get to the seat of government and attention will be offered. I also know that um, the executive of the Choco CU are at the regional uh, police headquarters in the northern region here to present uh, a petition to the to have a meeting actually and present their petition to the police command to actually look at some of the issues that are being raised. And, and one major issue they, they are asking for is um, the lift on the ban on motorbike because they said in the communities and hinterlands, it is the motorbike that is a means of transport. And so if a pregnant woman is in labor now, mm. it is the motorbike that we need to carry into uh, the hospital, and if they are banned, how do they do all this? And so that's currently the, the state now in Cherry Is that to suggest, Martina, that the police has not officially responded to their petition? Not yet. Um, that was, the one they presented was to Cherry Pony, and now the group um, is meeting with the regional police command. I'm sure right after the meeting we'll have more on what they have raised. In that case, we'll come to you after that meeting with the Regional Police Command. That's Martina Bugri reporting there um, from the northern region. Now, away from that story, aide to former President John Mahama, Joyce Baum of Tari, has urged the chairperson of the Electoral Commission to consider her posturing when addressing sensitive national issues, as well as the opposition NDC. According to Ms. Baumoktari, Madame Jean Mentes posturing during her appearance at the Short Commission of Inquiry into the Ayawaso West Wagon by election violence and at a recent IPAC meeting was unhealthy. She spoke to my colleague Kojo Yangsen on AM Show. Your posturing leaves room for concern. Any well meaning member of the position, the largest opposition party, the party that has won the most elections under the Fourth Republic, will leave cause for worry. You know, the body of the Electoral Commissioner, even your body language, how you communicate even to other political parties, is what will actually set you apart from the rest. It is what endorses you as this lawful arbiter, this individual, that even when the opposition has complaints about the conduct or posturing of governments, they can come to you and expect a fair mediation. I think on this occasion, a little bit of that is lacking. Note also that Madame Gino said, is actually from the G Institute of Mensa. Gene Mensa is from the Institute of Economic Affairs, a body that has actually acted in Ghana's democracy for a very, very long time. I think there's always been some modicum of friction. There have been some conversations that have taken place in the past, some comments that we pass every now and then. Of course, at the time, who would have thought that one day Madame Jean Mensa would be appointed chair of the Electoral Commission? Mm. So I think that even for that alone, there is need for her to actually take a deep breath, think through carefully. It is a very sensitive position, a hotbed of enormous criticism where you deal with very sensitive matters that a little bit of any omission, any inaction 
even a comment that is not well thought through can easily degenerate into something else. It calls for circumspection. It calls for a certain attitudinal change. It even calls on you to watch your facial expressions like I'm doing this morning. If I were out there having a conversation, mm. I'd probably be more animated. I'll probably have a higher tone. I'll probably have a certain demeanor. But this is a very controlled environment where you believe that you want to make your point in a way that people would understand, they would listen and appreciate the point you're making. The word posturing encapsulates all of this. Now, Madam Joyce Bauer Mokhtari also added that the special prosecutor should have shown respect to the office of the former president, John Dramani Mahama, by officially writing to him after he was petitioned to investigate President Mahama for allegedly diverting $13 million from a private company, EO Group, meant for development. She was speaking to my colleague, Kojo Yangsen, on the AM show this morning. If the petition, the office of the special prosecutor, and an individual such as a former president, a distinguished individual of society, a leader of the society is mentioned, I, in the seat of the office, would write formally even that I have received or I'm in receipt of such a petition just as a way of informing or updating the office of President John Dramani Mahama. Secondly, I would expect that you would conduct an investigation timelessly because you understand the exigency of the day that once a name such as this has been mentioned, it would actually generate enormous discomfort and disquiet. But I will also remember that at his vetting, where it mattered most, the Honorable Martin Amidu refused to admit to the said publication and actually described it as a perception that was within the public domain at the time. And he sought to harness the public thoughts and sentiments by putting that in his article. In any case, the company they speak of is a publicly listed company. I am sure if there any cause of concern, they would have probably come out blazing. How, in any case, do you think that a president, a vice president, or even a minister has any way of influencing a transfer of shares? The Registrar General is there. I'm sure if you go there, you can find the shareholders list. You would find who the shareholders are. In fact, the law allows you to pierce the veil of incorporation and find out who the individual shareholders are in that company. And these are very easy. The Honorable Matnamid is the most senior advocate of the Supreme Court of Ghana. Even if we are close to 20 years at the bar, we are nowhere near them. They are fathers of the law, repositories of everything that is justice. He knows a lot more than I would ever be able to espouse. And he knows that where an unsubstantiated allegation has been made about the person of a man of the teacher of John Ramani Mahama, that some seriousness should be attached to it. But this sort of propagandist thing that we reduce the office to is needless. Away from Madam Joyce Bauer Mokhtari, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction 2019 Global Assessment Report has one of new emerging and much larger threats than ever experienced in the history of mankind, largely because of climate change. The over 400-page report, which is the first assessment and evaluation of how nations have fared in implementing the Sandai Framework of 2015, identifies the growing trend of environmental degradation and growing potential of one disaster uh, producing another as a signal of how dire things could get if the world continues to engage in unsustainable growth patterns. Joy News' Latif Idris is part of the UN Disaster Risk Reduction Journalist who participated in the 2019 Global Platform in Geneva, Switzerland and reports nations, including Ghana, have made commitments to mitigate risks by building resilient environments. As the world faces increasing risks from floods, earthquakes, and other natural disasters that have killed thousands and left many other homeless, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction has assembled governments, experts, and scientists, plus other stakeholders here in Geneva, Switzerland, to fashion out risk-informed sustainable development policies to mitigate current and future disasters. The United Nations Global Platform is the world's foremost gathering on reducing disaster risk and building resilient communities and nations. In 2015, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction 
assembled governments in Japan and adopted the non-binding Sandai framework, which among others has the target of substantially reducing global disaster mortality by 2030 and also reduce direct disaster economic loss in relation to global gross domestic product by 2030. It's a big job. It's not easy. Um, and another thing I must say is that there are so many reporting requirements now for the countries. They have to report against the Sendai framework, they have to report against the Paris Agreement, the SDGs. And what we are trying to do is we, are, we need to find a way that can alleviate a bit the burden of reporting for the benefit of the member states, especially the developing countries. So that's something that is under discussion um, a lot. The Sandai framework also urges nations to shift from managing disasters to reducing risks. So I asked NADMO and the delegation from Ghana how the nation is incorporating this Sandai framework in managing disasters in the country. And back home in Ghana would think and still believe that the existence of NADMO is just for uh, providing sardines and tin tomato and mattresses in, in, in cases of flooding. But then uh, coming to conferences of this nature, one want to understand to a large extent the role of NADMO, which is very critical in the country. Now more than ever, Ghana requires a disaster risk reduction policy, perhaps urgently, considering the scary fact that the country's defective fault lines has resulted in three air tremors in 2019 alone. Still so live on Joy News today with me, Daniel Dazi. Still to come, headmistress of Achimota Basic School, Edith Tremanting, has told Joy News a headcount conducted on both day and boarding students has given a contrary outcome of uh, the report of an abduction of one pupil of the school. Also in business, the majority of Ghanaians have no idea how profits from the extractive sector is spent. That's according to a new report by the Kumasi Institute of Technology, Energy and Environment. Details shortly. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us now. Headmistress of Achimota Basic School, Edith Tremanting, has told Joy News a headcount conducted on both day and boarding students has given a contrary outcome of an abduction report of one student of the school. Early Wednesday, a hawker rushed to the school and raised alarm of a suspected case of abduction by a kidnapper in a taxi. But as the headmistress tells Joy News, only two students who did not report to school on Wednesday have not been accounted for. Latif Idris visited the school Wednesday evening and has come through with this report. Here at the Achimota school, in the background, are pupils of the Achimota Basic School who just finished with a worship and a prayer session here at the school. Probably to thank God for letting a particular cab pass the school. And I'm talking about the case of a suspected kidnapping that took place Wednesday morning here on the streets of the Achimota Basic School. We are told by the headmistress of the school that a hawker rushed to the school to complain about what a taxi driver had told her of a case of a suspected kidnapping that had happened. Now, upon hearing that information, the headmistress, we are told, informed the police and conducted a headcount the headcount has proven, according to the headmistress, that none of her students or pupils has been kidnapped. In fact, they've conducted search on the borders and the day students, and only two students, that is the day students, did not show up to school today. They are the two the school is unable to account for as at now. But the headmistress who spoke to us earlier told us that the description given by the hawker who lodged the complaint about the case of a suspected kidnapping does not really match the description of her students. We are told by the hawker that 
the girl who allegedly is kidnapped had braided her hair and was wearing a yellow polo shirt on a black skirt. That description, according to the headmistress, does not match the description of her student. Now, the police has also issued a statement saying their investigation into the matter so far has shown that the alleged reports lack facts. Let me share with you details of that statement issued a short while ago. Now, it reads, the Ashimoto police has been investigating a kidnap report it received within its jurisdiction this morning. Now, as you notice, it's dated 22nd May, which was on Wednesday, uh, involving a schoolgirl who was allegedly kidnapped by an unregistered Toyota Corolla vehicle. The information so far lacks some factual accuracy um, after it was swiftly acted on. As part of its investigation, the scene was visited and headcounts and checks were made in neighboring schools for verification, but to no avail, efforts made to locate a taxi driver who um, was mentioned to have witnessed the incident have proved futile. Okay, they end the statements by putting their emergency lines there in case you want to report any information. We'll move from that story and about 200 residents of Atonsu S line in Kumase have been displaced by floods that's destroyed due to the diversion of a drain by a Chinese construction firm. Victims say blockage of the Susuan drainage um, by China, China Henan International Corporation, Chico, um, which dredging, which, uh, pardon me, which is responsible for dredging and lining the stream is, well, that's what happened. Now, Ohiming Teria visited the community to find out um, how affected persons are coping since Monday's heavy downpour. It's been three days since torrential rain resulted in floods in many parts of Kumasi. At least one person has been confirmed dead, while a nine-year-old girl said to have been swept away by running water is yet to be found. About 40 houses, a chapel and mosque were inundated with water, some up to waist level at Atonsu S line. Many residents have been rendered homeless after their homes submerged and children are unable to go to school. The Chinese company diverted the course of the water to our backyard here. The current was so strong, it broke the fence wall and water filled our homes. We have lost everything. Where to lay our hairs is now an issue. Amid huge losses, residents try to salvage what is left of their personal belongings from bathing to electronic gadgets. They are demanding compensation from China Henan International Corporation, Chico, which they blame for their predicament. Our clothes and everything are gone. Here we are, empty. We have to start life all over again. Government must intervene. We will appreciate any form of compensation. We have not known peace ever since the Chinese diverted the drains. They turned deaf ear to our earlier warnings. We returned from work on Monday to see our homes flooded. My kids cannot go to school because they have lost everything to the water. Municipal Chief Executive for Asokwa, Akonyase Jima, shares the sentiments of the people against the construction firm. So this is as the cause of the Chico company, the company that is constructing the road from Brewery to this end. They didn't do a good job. So we've been there this morning. We've talked to them and they've admitted that they, 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 they yeah, they've admitted that they caused the whole problem. So they've given us or they have assured us that from today till Sunday everything should be okay. The MCE has since met with officials of China Henan Corporation and tabled compensation demand of victims. We discussed compensation package with them but uh, it wasn't conclusive so we definitely have to go back and talk to them but yes compensation aspect came up. The construction firm has declined comment on the issue insisting all questions are directed 
at the Urban Rules Department from Kumasi. Oh, you mean report. Now, she used to live a life of misery, pain, and stigma due to a devastating childbirth injury known as obstetric fistula. The condition made her leak urine. And that's the story of Abina Mayamau, uh, but whose situation was featured in a recent Joy News Hotline documentary titled Twisted by Birth. But now there's good news after the broadcast because Abina has undergone a successful surgery. As Ghana joins the rest of the world to mark International Day to End Obstetric Fistula, Joy News' Beryl and Estina Richter travels back to Abina's village in Muna in the central region to find out how she's been living her new life. If it weren't for Joy News, I would still have been in this helpless situation. Now I am free and healed. That was Abna describing how hopeless her situation was a few months ago. Her story has changed now and she feels like a real woman. This is the extent to which the terrible medical condition called obstetric fistula had stripped Abna of her self-esteem and dignity. In April 2018, when we visited, the pain and shame inflicted on her as a result of leaking urine made her harbor suicidal thoughts. I have suffered a lot due to this condition. I don't like to drink water. In fact, I feel restless. Sometimes, I wish I was dead, so that the suffering can end. I am back here again at Imuna to meet Abna. This time around, Abna is elated. She's beaming with smiles as she welcomes me. This is because her days of anguish, despair and hopelessness are over. Abna is optimistic about the future now because she has successfully undergone surgery at the Catholic Women's Hospital in Mankasim. My situation is better now. In fact, God has been good to me. Thanks to Joy News too. Dr. Gabriel Ganyaglo is an obstetrician gynecologist and a trained fistula surgeon at the Kulibutijing Hospital. He was part of the medical team that operated on Abna. According to him, Abna benefited from the 100 in 100 initiative launched as part of the commemoration of the International Day to End Obstetric Fistula in 2018 by the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA and its partners. Very interesting to note that they had to take your documentary for us to see that they were there. Access Bank paid for all the surgeries for that cohort of fistula patients. And indeed, they have an arrangement with the Mercy Women's Catholic Hospital in Mankasim, where they have pledged to pay for 100 fistula repairs. So Abna benefited from that package. Life beyond repair can have intense emotional, social and economic impact on women and their families. Abna tells me how she now depends on the support of family to survive after her successful surgery. I just called a friend for a 20 Ghana CD loan, but that is yet to hit my mobile account. That is yet to hit my mobile money account. Unlike Abna, who is fortunate to have benefited from free surgery facilitated by UNFPA, Access Bank, and the Catholic Women's Hospital, Grace Esieku hasn't. She is still living with a dehumanizing condition called fistula. This is Grace telling me her story last year when I visited. Hmm. Because I feel sad whenever I'm about to eat. This is because of the pains I will have to endure whenever I attend to nature's call. Coming up in business, majority of Guineans have no idea how profits from the extractive sector is spent. That's according to a new report by the Kumasi Institute of Technology 
energy and environment. And later in showbiz, organizers of the 2019 VGMA places indefinite ban on Stone Boy and Shatawale's participation in future events and directs them to return the awards given them Saturday night. Stay with us.